Hi, everyone. Welcome. Feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat as you're coming in. We'll get started in just a minute or two. Welcome, everyone. Feel free to drop your name and where you're calling in from in the chat. Welcome, welcome. I see many people continuing to pour in from the waiting room. Feel free to go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat as you come in. I'm seeing Dominique from Florida, Jennifer from Los Angeles. Good morning, Rosa, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, Allie from Las Vegas, Carol from Texas, Jan from Virginia, Fred from Philadelphia, Jamie from Arizona. See Mary from the Bronx. Welcome everyone. We'll get started in another 30 seconds or so. Feel free to keep on introducing yourselves. All right, I'm seeing the Introductions continue to pour in. There are a few too many for me to keep up with. Um, I just know that I see you. I'm glad you're here. Uh, I have 2.32 p.m., so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I know people will continue to come in and continue to introduce themselves in the chat. Um, we've got a packed program today, so I'm gonna, gonna take, us, um, take us into it. Uh, I'm Courtney Cooperman. I use she, her pronouns and I'm the project manager of the National Low Income Housing Coalition's Our Homes, Our Votes campaign. Thank you so much for joining the 11th webinar in our series on the topic of voter education, the who, what, where, when, why, and how. If you're tuning into this webinar series for the first time today, I encourage you to check out the archive of our past webinars on our website, and we'll go ahead and drop that link in the chat. Again, feel free to keep on introducing yourselves as you're coming in. So the election is less than two months away from today, and now is really the time, if you haven't done so already, to start planning how you'll educate your communities about what to expect on the ballot, the logistics of voting, and the stakes of voting for housing justice. We have an all-star panel today to offer some guidance and inspiration and resources on this topic. We'll have Camila Ahmed, the Voter Engagement Coordinator at the Coalition on Human Needs, Daniela Pierre, who's the president of the NAACP Miami-Dade branch and an alumna of NLIHC's Tenant Leader Collective. We'll have Zoe williamson Crutini, the Associate Digital Communications Director of Students Learn Students Vote. And then I'll give a brief update on how you can use the Our Homes, Our Votes TurboVote platform as a voter education tool. As always, before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping items. First, this webinar is being recorded. We'll distribute the recording and the links in this week's edition of our Friday email newsletter, The Connection, and the recording will be posted on the NLIHC YouTube channel and on the Our Homes, Our Votes website by the end of the week. Second, we have closed captioning enabled. As always, thank you again to our captioner for being here today. Please ask questions using the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. With so many people attending, uh, it can be a little bit of a challenge to catch your questions in the chat and we're more likely to notice them in the Q&A. Speaking of the chat, we ask that everyone engage thoughtfully and respectfully and live by the platinum rule. Treat others the way they want to be treated, even if that's different from the way that you want to be treated. And last but not least, a reminder that Our Homes, Our Votes is 100% nonpartisan, meaning that we don't endorse or favor specific candidates or political parties. Our goal is to build the voting power of low-income renters so that we can hold all elected officials and candidates accountable to prioritizing housing justice. Um, so with that, I am going to hand it over to Camila to get us started with our presentations. Hey y'all. Um, Courtney, am I bringing up the slideshow? Okay, perfect. Okay, awesome. So I saw in the chat um, that somebody is from Birmingham, Alabama, which I think is so cool because I'm actually calling from Huntsville, Alabama. And I used to live in Birmingham um, for two years and I did a lot of political um, activism work out there. So, 
Hey, Alabama. Um, but like I said, um, my name is Camila Ahmed. Hey, <laughs> my name is Camila Ahmed. And I am the um, voter engagement uh, coordinator and outreach coordinator at the Coalition on Human Needs. And I am running their Vote for Human Needs campaign. So I am a hire that they have um, brought on specifically for this. I started in July. Um, you know, as you know, the election is in November. So to say that we are hitting the ground running is an understatement, but it has been so fun. Um, I've really enjoyed um, working uh, with y'all um, and meeting different folks doing voter engagement um, work, especially in the C3 space. So very excited to be talking to y'all today. All righty, let's get started. Okay. Did I do that? Okay. Um, about the Coalition on Human Needs. So the Coalition on Human Needs um, is an alliance of national organizations working together to promote public policies which address the needs of low income and other vulnerable populations. The coalition's members include civil rights, religious, labor, and professional organizations. Oakland, California, and I'm from San Francisco, y'all. I'm reading the chat, I'm getting distracted, but I'm gonna get back to it. Um, service providers and those concerned with the well-being of children, women, the elderly, and people with disabilities. Um, so I'm gonna actually drop in the chat, if you're interested in becoming a, a member at CHN, you can absolutely do that. I'm gonna drop that um, link in the chat. Um, but yeah, Alabama and the Bay Area. The Bay Area is what uh, where I was born, and um, and I spent a lot of my adulthood in Alabama. So, hey y'all. Um, but yeah, all right. Next slide. So the value of nonprofit um, nonprofits doing voter engagement work, right? With the nation's attention heightened during the presidential election years, we had this unique opportunity to raise awareness about the issues that matter most. And real talk, y'all, people are running for office, right? And that is power that we can leverage. We are not only this coalition of, you know, national organizations who care about, um, you know, advocating for the needs of people, but we also have access to our own members, you know, individuals. Um, and, you know, if we look at the power of each vote, right, these facts. In 2016, the swing states of Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania were decided by a combined 77,000. 744 votes. And in 2020, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Georgia were decided by just 42,918 votes combined, y'all. And so with these razor thin um, margins, right, in these elections, we really do have power um, that we can leverage where we can say, hey, if you are interested in getting my vote, this this is what these are my stipulations. These are the things that we care about. Um, and so it's a it's a great time to, again to raise awareness while people are paying attention um, and also let folks know, um, you know, that these these are the issues that affect the lives that we live, that affect the work that we do. Um, and that is power that we can leverage. And we actually had a webinar and I'm going to drop in the chat too, um, a webinar uh, the other day about empowering nonprofits and service providers to do um, GOTV and voter work um, in this space. And one of our panelists said something that I think was really profound, especially for people who are like worried about doing this type of work, right? Is it safe to do um, voter engagement work um, without, you know, uh, messing up your our, our, our commitment to being a nonprofit? Um, but she was saying, essentially, what we're doing is just inviting people to the table to have the conversation. That is the role that we play, and that is absolutely fine um, for us to do. Um, so next slide, but I'm also going to drop in the chat. Um, if you guys are interested in listening to that webinar, you can. Oh, I'm sending the link to the host and panelists. It does not look like I have access um, to sharing with everyone. So if, if we can change that um, on there, I'll resend those links um, so that so that they are available to everyone. In the meantime, um, so what kind of things are we doing? What resources do we have available? Um, first and foremost, over the last couple of months, we've been working on a series of voter issue guides. So just, you know, right now they are in, in sort of like PDF format, just text, so people can kind of like use, use the information as they see fit. Towards the end of the month, we'll be taking the same information and developing a social media toolkit that has like uh, what's it called, you know, graphics and whatnot that people can easily share onto their Instagram pages. And then we'll also be breaking the information down into sample tweets um, to help people um, talk about this on their either uh, personal or organizational um, social media pages. And within that, um, we have six guides total, vote for a better care system, vote for a better health care system, 
vote for better housing, vote to fight hunger, vote to help families and low income people and vote to protect our democracy. And so within this, we're highlighting important facts like the fact that in 2023, 14 states created 17 different laws to make it harder to register to vote, mostly affecting voters of color, right? Um, in housing, we're talking about the fact that over 50% of those who live in shelters and 40% of those who are unsheltered are actually employed either full or part time, right? Which means that people are struggling to survive even working full time, right? Um, or the fact that 26 billionaires paid an average of 4.8% in taxes, um, like I said, over the last um, six years, while families paid 37%. So these sort of things that are important to highlight um, that uh, also tie into why we need to vote. Um, okay, that's updated, so I'll make sure um, I'll make sure to, to resend those links. But yeah, so um, we're talking about those things um, in these guides, um, breaking it down, talking about some of the policies that are expiring in 2025 um, and things like that, um, especially the policies that directly affect people who do human needs work. Um, and so, yeah, those will be available. And I'll also make sure that um, that that you guys um, have access to those, I think, in the follow up email. Um, but yeah, so we're excited to share that um, and look out for our social media toolkit. Alrighty, so I know what you're thinking. You learned about the resources that we have to offer. We'll also be doing like a voter engagement kind of one pager for people who want like a one stop shop of like just inform, you know, FAQ sort of things, information that you need to know, um, and also links to our different partners who um, have helpful resources around, you know, checking registration, how to host a voter registration drive, things like that. So look out for that. We all are a small team, and I am uh, kind of like, you know, it's me and my colleague, and so we're cranking things out, uh, you know, as, as fast as we can. Um, but keep an eye out for that because we will have that. Um, moving into what we are doing in terms of like field and outreach, and also how you can get involved. Um, first and foremost, CHN and Vote Riders. I'm sure that many of you have heard of the work that Vote Riders does. They are an awesome organization. We are so happy um, to be partnering with them. Just to read their bio. It says Vote Riders is a nonprofit, um, nonpartisan organization committed to helping voters obtain state issued IDs or driver's license in, in the state where they are registered or are looking to register. Um, Vote Riders provides comprehensive support by locating, ordering, paying fees um, for the underlying documents such as birth certificates and social security cards. And they will also schedule appointments arrange transportation and cover the cost of obtaining an ID or a driver's license. So this is extremely valuable, not just for ensuring that people are voting, but we all know that IDs are helpful for so many things. Um, and so they really are doing um, really great work. Their target states include Arizona, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Wisconsin. If you are in one of those, um, in one of those focus states, they have a state director, um, someone who who um, does that work specifically for that state. However, if um, if you were not in that state, but you got, you're you still in need or you know people who are who may be in need of this service, they generally will, if you contact kind of like their um, overall office, they generally will um, see what they can do um, about helping, but those are their um, target states where they have, uh, you know, like really, really solid presence. Um, in my conversations with most of our state partners, the main thing that they've talked about needing um, help with or the main way that we can kind of like assist them in the work that they do, they talk about having the people power, having the resources. Yes. Um, thank you so much, Courtney. Um, having the uh, the people power, having the resources, having the funding. Um, but one thing that would be helpful to them is if you are a service provider and you are working with clients who work, uh, working with clients who may be in need of this service, um, you know, they would greatly appreciate that connection. Um, and so that can be done, you know, either via word of mouth, or we actually have also a flyer that we sent off in an email blast. And I can also um, provide that um, to Courtney, if that would be a helpful resource to you guys. But a flyer that you can just post up in your social service agency, in your office, that's visible for clients to see, that just kind of lets you, lets them know like, hey, we are vote writers, we do this. And if you are in need of this service, please call this number. And so we can make sure um, we can make sure that you uh, that you get that information. 
All righty, CHN and Vote Forward. So Vote Forward is an organization that does letter writing. Um, this is letter writing to uh, directly to voters. Um, you know, when I first heard about it, I thought it was letter writing to uh, to like, you know, elected officials, things like that. But it's similar to um, if you've ever done campaign postcarding, um, it's basically that. Um, so uh, their bio is Vote Forward is a 501c4 nonprofit organization that empowers grassroots volunteers to send handwritten letters encouraging fellow Americans to vote. Vote Forward letters can boost your turnout by as much as 3.4 percentage points, um, and their states are or um, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, North Carolina, Nevada, and Ohio. So the way that theirs works you can, you, with them, you really can only um, send letters out to their states. You kind of like choose the state, um, then they they like give you the letters, you print them out on there. It has like the address and the name of who you'll be sending it to. Um, and CHN and Vote Forward hosts monthly virtual letter writing parties um, together and will begin hosting them weekly in the month of October leading up to the Big Send. Um, and the Big Send is essentially, um, as we get closer to the election, there's going to be this window. We haven't been sending them like as we're writing them. We're writing them, writing them, writing them, writing them. And then up uh, as we as we get closer um, towards the election, we're sending them all out in like one solid week. Um, and that is so that you know, we're not sending them so early that the reminder is no longer, um, you know, effective um, because people have forgotten, but we're not sending them so late that they get their letter after the election, right? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so that is something that we do. They're really, really fun. If you've ever done like postcarding or, you know, anything kind of like that, you know that it tends to be often, um, you know, kind of an older crowd, um, but it's usually like 50 or so of us, you know, we have a playlist, sometimes we'll have a uh, trivia at the beginning, um, and we just turn the music on and we have ourselves a little party from our living rooms. And so um, if you'd be interested in joining um, something like that, we would absolutely um, love for you to join. Yes, I will make sure that you guys get all this information um, in the follow-up email. Um, and then I'm also going to um, re-put the links that I put in earlier um, in the chat because initially they went to just the hosts and panelists, but now I have access to everyone. So I will drop those off. But if you ever have, um, you know, free time in your evening and want to, um, you know, make an impact uh, right from the comfort of your home, we would love to have you. All righty, CHN and the Empower Project. Um, many of you have probably heard of the Empower Project and the Empower app. Um, so the Empower app is a free tool um, to build power through relationships. So this is a relational organizing tool. Um, for those who don't know, relational organizing is essentially very similar to traditional campaign tactics where you're doing things like canvassing, like phone banking, like text banking. But instead of contacting strangers like you would from either, you know, some sort of uh, file um, generally um, a voter file. Yes. And someone else made a good point about vote forward. You can also do it on your own. So you can join join the parties. But once you make an account, you know, if you want to spend a solid 24 hours of your day writing letters, you absolutely have uh, the opportunity to do that. Um, but relational organizing essentially is um, is, you know, you're contacting your network instead of strangers. And so the idea is, is that it would be, it's, it's you know, a phone call from me to somebody random is going to be less effective than me calling my brother and being like, hey, can you go vote? And so that is um, something that the Empower app offers to um, 501c3s and 501c4s for free in both English and Spanish. Um, and we will also be hosting weekly text banking parties in the month of October. Alrighty, last but not least, CHN and Vote Rev Action Fund. Um, so very excited to be working with Vote Rev Action Fund. You guys may have heard of them before too. They are formally um, called Vote Tripling. And so even if you haven't heard of the organization, you may have heard of just the Vote Tripling Ask where people are like, you know, hey, would you mind pledging to remind three friends to vote? Um, and so that this is the same organization. They essentially field test um, their research organization and they field test um, organizing tactics um, and then they mainstream them, stream them. And so CHN and the Vote Rev Action Fund are going to be teaming up to host a special webinar on October 3rd at 4 p.m. EST. And I'll drop that also in the chat. Um, and you can kind of just learn about how uh, C3s, individuals, organizations 
can in a very like low lift, um, you know, high Im impact way, um, really make a difference in um, an election turnout. And that is that link. If you would like to register, we'd love to have you. Um, and if you are not able to make October 3rd, I would say go ahead and register anyways. Um, I sent that directly to Courtney. Um, <laughs> I would say go ahead and register anyways. Okay, there is that link. Um, and we will send the recording out in the follow-up email anyways. And so along with the toolkit and all of the information. So, you know, if you can come in person, we'd love, um, or virtually in person, we'd love to have you then. And if not, absolutely fine. We'll send you the recording. And last slide. Thank y'all so much. Like I said, my name is Camila Ahmed and I am the Voter Engagement and Outreach Coordinator. Um, and you can contact me at cahmed at chn and I'll also drop my Calendly in the chat if you'd like to, uh, you know, chat about uh, connecting with others doing C3 work or if you just uh, want to chat through uh, plans and need a little bit of, of advice. I am your uh, Voter Engagement Bestie and can't wait to chat. Thank you so much, Camilla. These are just such incredible resources. Uh, we love having you as a voter engagement bestie. Uh, I encourage people to put questions in the Q&A for Camilla, and we'll circle back to those with the rest of our panelists towards the end. Um, and with that, I will pass it along to Daniela. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniela Pierre, hailing from Florida, Miami, Florida, from the 305. Um, and I want to start off with saying affordable housing is what democracy looks like. So it's supposed to be a chant. So affordable housing is what democracy looks like. Okay, so we got to remember that if we want to save our democracy, if we want to make certain that things are equal, fair, and just, that's usually going to start with where a person resides, right? Because you have to be able to thrive. You have to be able to live and you have to have access to accessible and affordable housing and able to do anything else. So we believe that housing is very, very important and paramount to the future of us all. So affordable housing is what democracy looks like. So when we're talking about voting, um, as mentioned, I do serve um, as the local branch president for uh, the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People here in Miami. Um, it's an organization that has been around since 1909. We are in our 115th year and we are all about the protection of civil rights and the protection of voter rights. OK, so while we're talking about the who, what, when, where and how of voting, we just know that this year we are recognizing the 59th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. OK, so we go back in history. Historically, not everyone had that right to vote. Right. And those who did obtain that right to vote had to go through a, a lot of things. Right. To be able to, you know, vote when it came on election day. So we take the vote very serious. It is sacred. And if you are eligible to do so, you should vote. It's your responsibility. Um, it's our collective duty and it helps to advance our communities forward. So when we talk about voting, when we're talking about who, who, that includes all of us, right? Who is the voter? The voter is a renter right? The voter is a homeowner. The voter is a college student. The voter is a retiree. The voter is the community, right? We are the voters, right? We are those stakeholders. So we should own our vote and show up and vote. Here in the state of Florida, there are a number of ways that people can cast their vote. If you're able to do so, you can vote early, Right. If you want to avoid um, any long lines, go vote on early voting period. OK, if you're saying I can't go to the polling place, maybe you want to vote by absentee ballot. Right. Then sign up to do that. There are deadlines um, according to each state where you have to request the uh, absentee ballot and you have to send it back signed in time. OK, so you can early vote vote by mail or show up on election day to do your voting. So we're talking about who, 
we are the voters. And it's important that we vote, right? And vote for those who are looking to advance equity, equality, and fair access to housing policies, right? It's, it's great that many people will talk about affordable housing. Right. We want to have those conversations because what the conversation does is break down the stigma, because we all know there is a stigma that runs rampant when we talk about housing for all. We need to break that stigma down, remove those silos and those barriers. So the conversations are necessary and very, very important. But what's also important is the policy. Right. We have to make certain that those who are, you know, running to represent us, you know, have the interest of us. And that's that's something that we can find out by. We can check their voting history. You know, we can check some of their positions. We can check their platform. And there are a number of ways that um, we can do these things. Right. Some have websites, some are on social media, some write op-eds. So you're able to kind of follow their narrative to see if they're truly, truly in this, you know, for housing equality and justice. So we, if there are some ways that you can do your research before you cast your vote as much as possible as you're developing your voting plan, right? And your voting plan includes knowing that you're gonna vote down the ballot, okay? So while the emphasis of election 2024 definitely starts with our office of the president, but what impacts how we live each day is at the local level, right? So it's very important that we're voting down the ballot because that's where a lot of the policy happens that will impact you on a day to day basis. So we have to be just as involved, just as engaged, and just as excited when we're talking about local politics, okay? Now, there's another way you can get involved with local politics. Attend a local commission meeting, right? Attend a council meeting, and most importantly, the school board meeting. So as much as possible, as we're talking about who benefits from voting. We do, but we have to take an active and proactive role when it talks about voting, okay? Um, voter education, so the what? Voter education is the process of being informed, right? You, you wanna be an informed voter, right? And that's meaning having some information that would allow you to make, you know, an informed decision when you go to carry out your vote. So again, as I mentioned, you can, you know, do some searching on the internet. Again, some, some of those who are running for office may write op-eds, they may show up at your church, they, you know, you may see them in the community, you know, have a question or two ready to ask those who are vying for your vote to see what their position is when it comes to housing justice, okay? Um, and, and when, when is it critical to vote? In every election, all elections matter, right? So all elections matter, right? And it's needed for us to vote in every elections. Even when those um, elections may have a runoff, you still need to cast your vote. It's very, very important. And as mentioned, you can vote on election day. You can vote early and you can vote by mail, okay? Um, why is voting important for affordable housing? Uh, when you vote, it directly influences in some way housing policy, right? So if you have those who are elected to serve, you know, who don't have, you know, any idea on how to um, address affordable housing, then what do you think is going to happen to affordable housing? It's going to continue to get um, a lack of funding, right? It's not going to be uh, promoted in a way that will include stakeholders that want to invest in the uh, benefit of our community. So it's, it's important that people who are elected to serve, right, have a position that is for the people and important to advance housing policies for all, not just for some. We want people to advocate for policies 
for all. As we're talking about uh, when to vote, you know, oftentimes in many communities, uh, it's a challenge for those to get to their polling location. So again, the Lyft, Lyft will be offering free rides to and from the polls on election day. So on November 5th, if you need a ride to the polls, be sure to check out Lyft because they will be offering um, free rides to the polls. And I'm quite certain other groups as well um, will be offering free rides to and from the polls. Some communities have um, souls to the polls, okay, where they march to the polls or whatever the case may be. If you want to get involved in that effort, um, connect with your um, local community organizations. But from a national perspective, um, Lyft, somebody had trouble. I'll put the article that they, they released in April. I'll put it in the um, chat when I get through with this. But thank you for letting us know that because they are a partner of the NAACP. So if we hear feedback that is not working out like it should, we need to address that. So thank you for sharing. Um, so Lyft is a partner. Um, housing is not really the issue. It's low-income homes. Um, that is a great point. Um, so when communities are saying we're going to have this um, affordable housing building blitz, you need to ask affordable housing for who, right? And there's so many labels in this housing thing. Like just you got extremely low income, very low income. We just needed somewhere to live, right? So it's very important that as people are coming into your community, um, you know, go to those zoning meetings, right? And ask the question, who is this housing being built for? Short story, I serve on a local CRA board and we have many people that come that want to build housing in our community. And I ask them, affordable housing for who? And they say, oh, for the workforce. Which workforce, right? I want to know who you're talking about because we all have, you know, these codes and who are you talking about? When I kept pushing the question, he was talking about people who make it six figures. Yes, they are a part of our workforce, very important. But we also have those who are not making six figures who also need access to affordable housing. So we have to drill down. When we have people coming in our communities trying to you know, take land that belongs to the people, they talking about they want to build housing, we have to drill down and ask those questions. Had it not been for me to ask that question, that developer would have been coming in saying, I'm building for the workforce, and he would have completely missed the community because that community is not even at six figures, okay? So we, we have to get engaged and be involved so we know these people are coming and they're not familiar with our community. One, we need to ask them affordable housing for who, right? And then we, as a collective group of concerned residents should also be putting together our demands, which is also known as a community benefits agreement. We need to be driving that CBA not the investor, not the developer, the people. We need to be driving that. And then when they bring theirs, we can do a cross check to see what we can align. And if we can't, we gotta go back to the table. So it's important that, you know, while we're talking about voting for this election, but voting is every day. Voting is every day. Those commission meetings, that's a vote. The school board, that's a vote. Your local county housing meeting, that's a vote as well. We have to be involved there too. So I talked about um, the lift, you know, getting to and from the polls. Many organizations are doing that, so check them out. Um, now, because we had a lot of changes and challenges with the election security, um, you know, some people may feel intimidated, right? It's all a plot to do voter suppression. Right, but there is a remedy and a resolve for that. Uh, there is a national number one eight six six R vote. It's available in multiple languages. If you feel that you are being intimidated, um, if they're not allowing you to vote, there is a number that you can call right to report it, and they have ways to get people on the ground to go and try to get a solution there. So don't leave, you know, give them a call so they can assist you right at that polling loca location. 1-866-R-VOTE, protect your vote. Listen, we're about 50 or so days 
from the election of our lives, it is important that not only do we go and vote, but we go get 10 more people and 10 more people and 10 more people. Pretty much tell a friend or tell a friend or tell another friend to vote. If we don't vote, we will be voted out. This is simple. Just that simple. If we don't vote, we will be voted out. And what are the things they're going to vote out? Housing. They're going to vote it out. What are the things they're going to vote out? Home ownership. Those down payment programs will be gone. We must vote. It is on us. So I definitely encourage you to remember affordable housing is what democracy looks like. And we can make that so by making certain that we elect people to serve that have the interest of the people and we hold them accountable. Again, I will put some links in the chat. You can connect with the NAACP. Um, you can continue to connect with us as well, our homes, our votes, because we know housing is built with ballots. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Daniela. I'm feeling so, so inspired. Um, thank you for covering the who, what, when, where, how, and most importantly, that why of why it matters for housing justice. And thank you for all your leadership in your community. Uh, I'm gonna pass it along to Zoe. Thanks so much, Courtney. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Zoe Williamson Curtini. I am the Associate Digital Communications Director for the Students Learn Students Vote Coalition, and we lead National Voter Education Week. So that's what I'm going to be talking about here today. Uh, I'll, I'll probably be calling it in view uh, for the remainder of the call just to shorten it. Also, apologies in advance. I am in a coffee shop. So if there's some ambient noise, Apologies. Um, but for those of you who are unfamiliar, National Voter Education Week is a annual initiative taking place this year from October 7th through 11th. Um, and the goal is to equip voters with the knowledge that they need to be conf to confidently participate in elections. Um, so one of the key reasons why National Voter Education Week is so important is because it is about more than just getting people to the polls. It's about breaking down barriers and increasing access to voting for all. So as many of you know, the election process can be really confusing, especially for first time voters or those who are unfamiliar with changing voter laws in their state. Uh, every election cycle, we see rules, deadlines and processes change, which creates uncertainty and confusion. Beyond these structural barriers, research shows that there are also psychological barriers that hold people back from voting. Many people feel intimidated by the process, unsure of how to participate, or worried that they'll make a mistake when casting their ballot. And we all know that voting should be straightforward and not overwhelming, but we can't assume that people automatically know how to confidently navigate this process. So that's where you guys come in. Um, as trusted voices in your community, you have the power to demystify voting. People are not gonna trust information that's coming from uh, like random people that they see on social media. They're gonna trust people that have already been sharing trusted information with them about their housing, about low income housing advocacy. And so if they're getting voting information from you guys, it's more likely that they'll believe it. Um, by providing education, uh, you can come back. Sorry, one second, let me go back to that last slide. Yeah, thanks. Um, by providing this information, uh, you can empower voters to understand the process, make informed decisions that will reflect their values and trust that their vote counts. And it's not just about counting, casting their ballot. Educating voters is crucial for protecting the rights at the polls and recognizing any attempts at voter suppression. An informed, engaged electorate ultimately strengthens our democracy. Next slide. So over the course of the week, October 7th through 11th, we'll focus on five key calls to action. So those are registering to vote, getting to know your ballot, making a plan to vote, and understanding the process. So there are a lot of common questions uh, for each of these calls to action that we have outlined answers to on our website. Um, and I'll drop a link to our website at the end of the call. But um, we have determined that these are the four main calls to action that voters need to know in order to, at the end, uh, cast their ballot with confidence. So registering to vote is, you know, a lot of people are doing voter registration, but making sure they understand why they're registering to vote. Um, people can't just show up at the, maybe in some states they have same day registration, but you still need, you know, an ID or proof of residency to register to vote. Getting to know your ballot 
is allowing uh, people to, you know, look down their ballot, um, have more lay terms for what the candidates' positions are, identify the candidates that are in alignment with their values, understanding constitutional amendments, ballot referendas, um, local initiatives that may be on their ballot that may have like complicated legal jargon so that when they go into the ballot box, um, that's not the first time that they're seeing these things on their ballot. They've had the opportunity to do research and understand why voting one way or the other will impact them. Um, making a plan to vote is extremely important, especially for uh, voters that are working, um, because it allows them to vote on their own schedule. If, if in your state you have early voting, really highly encouraging early voting as you can um, schedule it around your busy work life, uh, child care, things like that. We know that on election day, the lines are often very long and voters have to take way more time off work in order to cast their ballot on election day. So just making sure that voters have everything that they need um, to vote with confidence and know when they're going to vote. Understand the process is a new call to action this year. Um, one thing that we've learned from partners is that a lot of voters that they're facing, uh, that they're working with, um, don't trust elections. They don't trust that their elections are going to be counted fairly, um, that their ballots are going to be counted, and they don't understand uh, why some states have a more delayed counting process um, than others. They don't know who is running their elections. So kind of adding some transparency and a peek behind the curtains into how elections are run will build confidence in voters that may um, think that elections are run unfairly. Um, and then finally, sharing with friends and family. So this one is not 100% voter education focused, but it's a very, very important call to action to incorporate into any of your election messaging, um, making sure that people um, are taking what they learned and educating the people in their communities, um, inviting three to five family members to go vote with them, um, encouraging their family members to research what's on their ballot, um, making sure that uh, we are taking um, this educational opportunity and expanding it as much as possible. Um, so we have a ton of resources and programming available to help you guys start planning your National Voter Education Week celebration. So if you want to go to the next slide. So one of the great things about InView is that it's designed to make voter education simple, especially for organizations that may be newer to voter engagement. Um, we make it very easy and it's very low effort, high impact opportunity. Um, so first we offer a wealth of ready-made resources. You don't need to create content from scratch. There are toolkits, social media graphics, newsletter templates, and sample language that you can use. Um, all of them are completely customizable, so you can tailor them to your community without lead needing a large communications team. Uh, second, everything is plug and play, so um, you can take our materials and plug them into your existing work streams during that week. Um, so if you're already sending out a housing-related newsletter, for example, you can dedicate a small section to voter education that week. Um, or if you're hosting a community meeting that week, you can incorporate a five-minute segment about why voting matters and how uh, you can participate in the election. There are even materials available in multiple languages. So if you serve a diverse community, uh, we have languages in six different Asian languages and also Spanish. Um, you can ensure that that content is accessible to everyone um, that you're trying to reach. So uh, really heavily recommend checking out our partner toolkit uh, to get started planning your voter education outreach. Next slide. So I'm going to talk about some concrete steps that you can take to celebrate InView and make an impact with minimal effort. So uh, first is digital participation. That's the easiest, but it's definitely um, the not not as impactful um, as having an in-person uh, conversation. But um, it's also the easiest way to get involved. Um, you can use social media language and graphics uh, we provide to start a conversation about voting online. Uh, we also, like I said, we offer newsletter templates, so you can send those in any regular communications that you send to your community, but we also have email templates. So if you just wanted to send a big voter education blast to your newsletter audience, um, that we make it very easy to do that. Um, you can also include calls to action, uh, like also like look at the calls to action and identify the ones that are the most relevant for your community um, or most relevant to the work that you already have planned. And you can just focus on those handful while also like directing people to learn more at nationalvotereducationweek.org. Um, 
Second thing that you can do is you can think about engaging your community directly. Um, so you could host a short virtual or in-person voter information session, um, 30 minutes where you talk about local voting rules, registration deadlines, or answer any questions that people may have about the process. On our website, we have a lot of programming ideas that align with all of the different calls to action that you can use as a jumping off point. And then we really encourage um, all of our partners to really tailor what we create uh, for your local community and you know your community better than anyone else. And so what is gonna resonate with them? Like, is there um, a local festival that week that you can plug into? Or is, um, you know, is there a restaurant that, you know, everyone shows up to on Fridays that you could partner with for your National Voter Education Week um, events? So thinking about how you can tailor these to uh, be better uh, suited for your uh, community. And then another easy and effective strategy um, is peer-to-peer -peer sharing. So encouraging your staff or community members to talk about voting with their neighbors, friends, or on social media. It can be as simple as like asking them to share their voting plan or why voting matters to them and like tagging a couple people or, you know, having a lunch where they talk through um, voting plans during this week. So and then finally, you could collaborate locally, uh, reach out to local voting advocacy groups. The League of Women Voters is really plugged into the work that we're doing, um, so they might be a great community partner for you to reach out to um, or civic engagement groups to really maximize your impact. Like you don't have to do this alone. Um, by working together, you can amplify your voter education efforts and make sure that your community is well informed. Next slide. So now that you have a sense of how National Voter Education Week works and how you can plug it into your current efforts, I have a couple of guidelines and tips to help you keep in mind as you engage your community. So the first one is um, it's critical to um, focus on remain to remain nonpartisan. Um, you want to focus on providing factual information without endorsing specific candidates or parties, um, especially if you're a 501c3, you have to remain nonpartisan. But beyond that, like we want to ensure that our outreach remains inclusive and trusted and that people who may not align with a political party or do align with a political party but um, are interested in voting information aren't turned off um, by the information that we're providing uh, because they see it as something that's not for them because it's in aligning with a party. And that's not to say that you can't talk about the issues that matter to you and how um, the issues show up on the ballot, uh, but it's just making sure that you're not endorsing a candidate or talking about how a political, a specific political party um, will impact these issues. So um, you can, you know, show, you know, how both parties, um, their stances on the issues that you're advocating for, and then let voters um, come to their own conclusions. Um, we also want to uplift why state and local elections matter specifically, you know, everyone is plugged in on the presidential election. Everyone is trying to figure out how they're trying to vote that way. Um, but as trusted messengers, you can really um, get across to them how state and local races and um, ballot measures impact their daily lives in a more immediate way. So whether that's housing policy, education, or healthcare, um, connecting these important issues uh, directly to local uh, elections may allow the people in your community to um, buy into the elections, especially if you're in a state that's not getting a ton of attention from the presidential election, but you still want your community to vote, um, painting the picture for them for how um, the issues that they care about are showing up on their ballot, but down ballot. Um, that's a really big role that you can play in your community this fall. Um, and then a couple more things. So you, you want to share the facts, not myths. So, yeah. you know, there's a lot of misinformation online right now, and it spreads really easily. Um, and that's probably a lot of what kind of information people are getting from social media around the election. Um, and it's important to counter that uh, by sticking to reliable, accurate information without centering the myth in your communications. Because when you center it, you're re just reinforcing those myths, um, but making sure that you're um, sharing this true information it's coming from reliable sources uh while also like not letting the misinformation win in that way um a couple other things national voter education week uh, makes voting fun approachable and part of your community um and we want to make sure that voting feels celebratory um a lot of times voting can seem like this bureaucratic process that people um 
you know, they, they don't really care. It's not something that's really interesting to them. And so they, they would rather opt out than try to figure out what's going on. But if you create a celebratory and fun environment through your events and your programming for National Voter Education Week, that's going to make people have some FOMO. That's going to make them want to be part of the work that you're doing because they see other people in their lives, their friends, their families, their community members having a fun time and enjoying voting. Um, and so creating that culture of voting is a really important part of uh, voter education. Um, and then the final thing is, you know, simplify everything. There's a lot of information uh, that people are getting from the election. And a lot of people are starting to get overwhelmed with the amount of information that they need. So the easier that you make it for people to engage with the process, the better. So things like providing pre-filled voter registration forms or offering stamps um, at your tabling for people that are doing, um, you know, vote by mail or sending in their voter registration application. Um, and, you know, maybe creating a voter guide that makes it easier for people to navigate what's on their ballot. All of these things helps take the guesswork out of the process and makes it easier for people who may have been considering not voting to buy in. Uh, next slide. So I'm gonna drop in the chat um, the link for you guys to sign up. Um, but yeah, so um, I just wanna leave you guys with this. National Voter Education makes, Week makes voter education really easy. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are resources, partnerships, and ready-to-use materials there for you to get started with your voter education journey in your community. Um, you can also start small and still make a big impact. Um, so as a next step, I want to encourage you to visit nationalvotereducationweek.org, sign up, and get access to all of these resources. From there, you can choose one or two simple actions, like sending a newsletter or posting on social media to get involved. It's really, really easy to participate this year. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions in the chat for how we can incorporate National Voter Education Week to your work, but I really would encourage all of you to join us as a partner. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zoe. We are a proud partner of National Voter Education Week, um, and National Voter Education Week is part of a suite of uh, nonpartisan civic holidays. We put together a fact sheet recently about ways that our network can celebrate, um, including some of the um, pieces that Zoe just mentioned, so we can drop a link to that fact sheet in the chat as well. Um, before we take a few questions, I just want to give a quick plug um, for our Turbo Vote platform, which I've mentioned on this webinar a few times um, in case you are new to our network or new to our calls. Um, TurboVote at ourhomes.turbovote.org is a tool that you can use to register to vote and update your voter registration, check your registration status, find election information for your community, and sign up for election reminders. Um, but critically, this isn't just a voter registration tool, it's also a voter education tool. And we can go to the next slide. Um, on TurboVote, you can see who and what is on your ballot. You'll see candidates for elected office at every level. You'll see statewide ballot measures. And if you live in one of the 100 largest cities in the country, a state capital, or anywhere in California, you'll also see local ballot measures. You'll find where to vote or drop off your ballot. You'll see when the deadline is to register, vote early, or return your, your mail-in ballot. And you'll learn, you'll learn about your voting options in your state, whether that's in-person early voting, mail-in voting, or in-person election day voting. We can go to the next slide. Um, just in terms of how to get there, so go to ourhomes.turbovote.org. We also drop that link in the chat. You can enter your address um, or select your state. If you select your state rather than enter your address, you'll only get information for statewide election, um, for statewide candidates and ballot measures. We can go to the next slide. Um, so once you address and once you enter your address, you'll see your voting hub, which again addresses all of that. Um, who, what, where, when, how um, on one page. Um, we can go to the next slide. And then once you're in there, you'll also be able to sign up for email or text election reminders, which ensure that you'll never miss a deadline. Um, it's also a good way to remember to vote in every election, not just the presidential elections. Local elections, um, as Daniela mentioned, tend to have lower voter turnout and renters are even more likely to be underrepresented. Um, so when you sign up for those reminders, you can really be empowered and empower your community to vote in every election. Uh, so again, that's at ourhomes.turbovote.org. 
We also have a user guide to this platform in terms of all of the features that it offers for voters and best practices for incorporating it into your organization's voter engagement strategy. Uh, we'll drop a link to the chat to that user guide um, and feel free to reach out to me if you ever have questions or want to do more um, on TurboVote. We can go to the next slide. Um, I'll also just flag that we have a sample voter guide. Um, I think a few of our speakers referenced voter guides as a voter education tactic. You can find that. Um, it's available in both English and Spanish at the link that we will drop in the chat for our voter education page. Uh, we can go to the next slide. All right, um, that brings us to our Q&A. Um, I see one question in the Q&A from Heather um, for Daniela. Is the Lyft free rides to the polls available in all states? Great question. Thank you so very kindly. Yes, it's across the country. Yes. Great. Thank you so much, Daniela. Um, let's see. Other questions? I see a lot of um, comments about in terms of just appreciation for all of you, appreciation for the work and for the resources. Um, I also see a comment from Jennifer. Um, um, Jennifer indicated that they're told they have to be a city employee to volunteer at the polls. Um, Jennifer, I know that every place has slightly different rules around um, being a poll worker, um, but I encourage you to look into that because in most places that that wouldn't be a requirement um, and there should be trainings available um, for anyone who meets certain eligibility criteria to become a poll worker. I'm not sure if any of our other panelists want to speak to that or have any experience with um, poll working. Well, generally the supervisor of election would offer um, poll worker training courses and you, you have to kind of complete that and then they kind of put you on this list, a standby list to see if you're going to be assigned a polling location. Uh, but the challenge, what I'm hearing from the comment, it seems like the, the working hours may conflict with the time that you may be called to serve. So that's an advocacy right there, right? So um, you may, if, you know, you may want to speak if you have a, a union, you know, or advocacy organization um, at your work site. That could be something where uh, maybe they give you all some type of flex time for civic engagement opportunities. Um, so here I work at Miami Day College, and what they do to encourage students to get more involved in the community, they have a civic action scorecard. So by doing a number of things you can get, um, whether it's you know a free lunch or whatever the case may be, and take that same kind of concept and idea to your employer. Like you know they give you sometimes um, wellness days, hey civic engagement days. So that can be something. I'll add one more comment on Daniela's point, but um, I just dropped in the chat a link to Power the Polls. They're a great group um, that recruits and organizes and helps you train to be uh, poll workers. Um, I would recommend checking out their website for FAQs and uh, they work with a lot of local elections offices. Um, like Daniela said, you know, this is based off of your local jurisdiction's rules, but um, working with a group like them might make it a little bit easier for you to navigate um, the different, you know, information that you're being given. Thank you so much, Zoe and Daniela. And yeah, that's a great point. Not every place has rules that are accessible and we can advocate on, you know, year round, not just during election season for better policies that enable all, all people to participate in the democratic process. Um, so we have just two minutes left and I wanna close with a few announcements um, and thank you so much to our panelists for all of the wisdom and inspiration today. Uh, if we could just pull the slides back up. Um, so tomorrow is National Voter Registration Day, um, a nonpartisan civic holiday dedicated to celebrating our democracy and promoting voter registration opportunities. If you haven't yet done so, please take the time tomorrow to register or check your voter registration status. Spread the word about voter registration to uh, like at least three of your friends or family members, and also post on social media. Um, you can use the hashtags VoteReady and Our Homes, Our Votes, and we'll drop in the chat um, links to social media toolkits, um, one, we, one from our partners at National Voter Registration Day, 
and one from our homes, our votes. Um, so you, there's a lot of sample content that you can use in those toolkits. We can go to the next slide. Uh, we also, I think we shared this already, we have a new resource with guidance for celebrating the civic holidays, including National Voter Education Week, as well as our general online resource library. We'll drop the link to both of those in the chat. We can go to the next slide. Um, we also have our next webinar is also on the theme of, um, of voter education. It's kind of a, think of it as a part two to this webinar, um, specifically on the topic of combating misinformation and disinformation. Uh, we'll have a pretty in-depth training um, from the League of Women Voters. So I highly encourage you to, to tune in. It's gonna be very informative um, and important for everyone who is serving and involved in communities that might be the target of misinformation or disinformation in this election cycle. And that'll be on September 30th, on um, the same time, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, looking forward to, to seeing you there. Uh, and here's a preview of the remainder of our webinars. Um, again, they run through two weeks after election day um, because this work doesn't end with the election. Um, we continue to talk about next steps and um, accountability. Um, so just encourage you to continue attending these and bringing the resources back to your network. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And finally, I know I've plugged this before and that many of you are already involved. Um, our Homes Our Votes has a network of affiliates, which is open to all nonpartisan organizations that share the goals of this campaign. We have office hours, we have a listserv, enhanced access to Our Homes, Our Votes tools and resources. Um, so please sign up to become an affiliate if you haven't done so already. Um, and we just dropped that link in the chat. I think that brings us to the end. Um, again, thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you to our incredible panelists. And please feel free to reach out to me at any point if you're interested in touching base about how you can bring these resources and this work to your network. Thank you all so much.